And Marianne Williamson is on the line with us. She is a candidate for Congress in the 33rd District of California, Henry Waxman's old district. Henry has, uh, Congressman Waxman has declared that he is retiring. She's the author of 10 books, lecturer, thought leader, Marianne.com, her regular website, her website for her congressional campaign, Marianne for Congress. Dot com. Marianne, you're there with us? Hey. Yes. Okay, great. Let's pick up some phone calls here because we got a whole bunch of them. Claudia in Prescott, Arkansas. You're on the air with, with Marianne Williamson. Hello. Hello. Uh, I just want to wish Marianne the best. Uh, it's such a breath of fresh air to have her uh, standing up for the United States of America. I hope that it rubs off her goodness in there and her open, open mindedness, open mindedness, and her deep well. Uh, thank you very much. Thank Bye-bye. you, Claudia. Thank you. Okay. Uh, D- John and um, Mundeline, Mundeline, Illinois, am I saying that Mundeline. right? Mundeline, yeah. Okay. Yes, you got it right, Mundeline. You're on the air um, with Marianne. Hi, thank you for including me in your conversation. I am a liberal. I, I more and more every day consider myself to be an atheist, but I greatly appreciate uh, Marianne's comments observing that many social and political movements began uh, with people of faith, Quakers and Martin Luther King, and I, I totally agree with you. And yet I find myself, as a liberal, at odds with conservative Christians who I feel want to codify into law uh, their religious views that would oppress homosexuals or limit women's reproductive freedom or push creation science. And I find myself saying, keep your religion out of government. And yet I totally admire Martin Luther King. How do I reconcile those two things? How am I not a hypocrite? <clears throat> Martin Luther King was not bringing religious doctrine or dogma into the conversation. What he was bringing in was spirituality, and spirituality is the path of the heart. And the path of the heart has to do with making love our bottom line. So Martin Luther King was not trying to impose anything. He was trying to call America to its greatness, because any individual or any system that is not seeking <clears throat> their own higher ground of love and compassion is not being called to its greatness. So the spiritual conversation is not the same as the religious conversation. Every religious, genuine religious conversation is spiritual, <clears throat> but not every spiritual conversation is religious. And so when you talk about the Quakers, the Quakers were not seeking to impose a dogma or a doctrine, what they were seeking, however, was to live according to the dictates of their conscience. And according to the dictates of their conscience, slavery was intolerable. Quakers, with their influence on the women's suffragette movement, they were not trying to impose a dogma. It's that their conscience found the suppression of women intolerable. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the primacy of conscience, not the primacy of religious dogma. Jeff in Denver, Colorado. You're on the air with Marianne Williamson. Hi, Marianne. Don't think we've talked since your IE America days when you backed Tom Hartman. <laughs> oh, hey, uh, hey. Well, hi, Jeff. Yeah. So, a long time. Anyway, uh, two quick questions. One is, what, what are your base principles that you would, you know, govern with, uh, help us govern with, such as, like, false force, false power and true power? <laughs> and then the other one is, how important are the open primaries, such as in California? to a third-party, well, a non-dominant party candidate. I believe that the founding of our country, Jeff, was important not just for political reasons but for philosophical reasons. The idea of real democracy is the greatest container for self-actualization of the individual. That's the purpose of liberty. That's the purpose of freedom, so that we can do that which we are capable of doing, uh, deciding for ourselves what that is without any external constriction. Now, the role of government, as I see it, is to balance a protection of that freedom with a concern for the common good. That is my philosophy of governance. That is what I believe the founders intended, for governing to be that balancing agent, protecting individual liberty and protecting the common good. Now, I, I believe that if we hold that that is the purpose of government and the person who serves as an elected representative uh, of the people <clears throat> is, by definition, serving the aspect of the equation which has to do with the protection of individual liberty and the protection by government against encroachment by any powers which would, um, uh, which would transgress against the common good. And that, to me, is my philosophy of what governance should be, and those would be the values that I would stand for in what I supported and how I voted. Does that make sense? Makes sense to me. In that sense, the real power, when you ask about false power versus real power, 
real power to me is what the founders intended to drive this country, which would be the power that emerges when people live, people who have been educated, people who are informed, that was the point of a free press and public education, <clears throat> when those people, uh, the citizens of the United States, knowing the information, having critical thought forms that have been honed through education, live from their own conscience, from their own wisdom, and from their own truth. And then they vote, and those votes are counted. False power is when you have what we have today, which is a new aristocracy, when moneyed forces basically say what they want first, and then everybody else gets to fight for the crumbs that are left. We repudiated aristocracy in 1776, and I think that we should repudiate it again. That, to me, is the issue of false power versus real power, the power that emanates from an economic system versus the power that emanates from the wisdom and the, the heart of the American people. Nina in Brooklyn, listening on WBAI. You're on the air with hey. Marianne Williamson. Peace and blessing to you both. Unfortunately, I won't be able to vote for you, but I wish you much success. Imagine if all Congress people actually cared about their constituency and there was no real separation between spirituality and state. Um, Ms. Williamson, I just want to thank you for your work. I attended a workshop where you had the uh, Caucasians, the white people in the audience, apologize to the African Americans for the um, vestiges of slavery. It was a very powerful moment for me. It's helped me to grow so much as an individual. So I just want to say prayerfully, I hope you can do that type of work in Congress, too. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Thank you so much. And mm. actually, there was a proposed legislation uh, years ago uh, during the, um, when Newt Gingrich was Speaker of the House. Uh, Tony, someone you'd probably remember his name. <clears throat> he was from Ohio, Tom. Mm. And he did propose a national apology for slavery. Yeah. Uh, which uh, was not put forward uh, past Newt, Newt Gingrich, but I think it was a good piece of legislation, and I would, I would support anything uh, on the part of Congress that acknowledged. You know, nations, as, as Lincoln said, a nation has to confess its sins. An individual has to admit its own character defects, and I think the United States admitting ours uh, would be an important thing and would help our country. Kathy in Valparaiso, Indiana, you're on the air with Marianne Williamson. Hi, how are you doing today, Tom and Marianne? I have a question for you. Um, we're, I know you're in a severe drought out west, and my idea was, since we're under too much snow, is there some way, if you were elected, that you could work with the representatives in Congress to find a way to convert our snow and run it through like a water line all the way out west, like through like Highway 70? So well, that way it would alleviate your problem with the drought and alleviate our problem. We're going to have a flooding. Well, thank you uh, on behalf of all Californians for your generous thinking. Um, we've got two issues here. One is water conservation, which is obviously a very big, uh, very big issue out here. And uh, <clears throat> as, as a member of Congress working with uh, state and uh, uh, local officials in California with all the really marvelous ideas afoot, having to do with water conservation is important. Now, from what I was reading in the paper today, <clears throat> nobody has an excess of snow these days. So even though it's very kind of you to want to send us your snow, I, I'm, I, I don't think that anybody has so much snow that they can send it to California. And, and given the fact that we have the Pacific Ocean here, I'm not exactly sure that that's the answer for uh, how we got our water. But thank you for the generosity, for sure. Ken in Minneapolis, Minnesota. You're on the air with Marianne Williamson. Hello, uh, Marianne. Um, yeah, very articulate and very thoughtful on your uh, positions. I was going to ask you if you are discussing or talking about reshaping the way we measure our economy uh, no, from no longer using the gross domestic product as a measurement of our economic health to moving towards something like the genuine progress indicator to measure our economic well-being. Uh, the Genuine Progress Indicator is now in motion in Maryland and Vermont, and they're going to be rolling it out in Oregon this spring. And basically, the Genuine Progress Indicator is a more accurate measurement of our economic health or well-being, uh, where we start to internalize external costs and start to value non-monetized activities like volunteerism and housework and so on. So I'm wondering if that's on your radar. Well, once again, like uh, several of the questions that have been asked today, what is on my radar is the larger question. 
the larger question, yes. Did I know about specifically about the genuine progress indicator? No, I didn't, and I will certainly look into it. The general conversation that you're introducing, I'm very much for, because the way we uh, indicate, measure, and even value progress in the United States is not in alignment with who we are as human beings. Human beings are more than economic creatures. So I certainly agree with you that when we talk about progress, we should talk about the hidden costs, the hidden costs of sanity, the hidden costs of <clears throat> human suffering, the hidden costs of, of societal degradation. So whether it's the genuine progress indicator or any other, the larger trend that has to do with people recognizing that just as in an individual life, how much money you make is not necessarily the indicator of how successful you are as a person or as a nation. That I'm all with it, and I will look into the, uh, the specific indicator that you've mentioned because I'm interested in that larger, uh, that larger dialogue. We'll be right back with more of your questions for Marianne Williams. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video archives. And you can check out Marianne's website at Marianne4FORCongress.com. We'll be right back with more of your, your questions for Marianne Williams. 